Welcome to the Muscle Expert Podcast with Ben Pakulski, one of the world's top professional bodybuilders, an expert on human performance and mindset mastery. Ben dives deep to deliver the strategies of the top experts to upgrade your body, mind, muscle, strength, performance, biochemistry, and how to become the upgraded modern man. Join us on benpokolsky.com to learn the cutting edge techniques to take control of your body, your brain, and create your greatest life. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Ben Pakulski, the host of the Muscle Expert Podcast. Welcome back. We have another great episode ahead for you today. Um, just to let you know, this is going to be a complete shift in the direction. This is not going to be about muscle building, but this is going to be about building a business based around muscle building, how to build a fitness business online. This gentleman has massive following, uh, amazing content, and really great resources online at the Online Trainer Portal. He's uh, the creator of the Personal Trainer Development Center. Um, and we have a really long conversation about the details that people are absolutely missing. So things like getting really clear on your long-term objective, not getting caught up in semantics and tactics on how to acquire short-term customers. Um, we, Jonathan Goodman and I go into some really great conversation about how to develop your own book and how to develop your own tribe and some really, really cool stuff that you definitely do not want to miss out on. Uh, if you want to get the transcript, you can head to benpakulski.com slash podcast. And please don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes. It drives us. And what we're going to start doing now is actually pulling one lucky winner from the reviews each week to announce on the podcast. And I'm going to be sending you guys a care package of amazing world-class products from this company, ATP Labs, Athletic Therapeutic Pharma. Um, ATP is a company that I'm recently aligned with that has literally the highest quality manufacturing that exists anywhere. Um, they're on the cutting edge of every ingredient and every formulation. They've got a team of researchers and a team of formulators working to put out the most efficaciously designed products anywhere. Uh, it's a relatively small company right now, but uh, the reason I've chosen to align with them is because their vision is clear and their focus is in impeccable. Um, so if you guys are interested in checking out ATP, it's atplab.com. Um, amazing efficaciously designed products and everything is third party tested. So everything that you, that you read on the label is present in the product. Um, atplab.com and enjoy the podcast and listen all the way to the end because Jonathan and I get into details about how to publish your own book and the process to master uh, putting out a best-selling uh, best book. And I hope you enjoy and I look forward to hearing from you. Jonathan Goodman, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, man. I'm psyched to be here. Dude, you're doing awesome stuff. I spent a lot of time over the last few days researching your books, researching your websites. Um, and, and truthfully, like you're doing this stuff a lot better than everyone, which is why I'm, I'm truly honored to have you as a guest. And I want to start off, as we spoke about, just giving people a little bit of insight of your background. Because as I went to your websites, your story is interesting, man, because I, I know, and you do, hundreds of people going through the exact same thing you are or, or you went through years ago when you started. You're like, hey, you know, I want to become a personal trainer because that seems like a great job. And then I'll let you tell the, I'll let you walk them through that, that journey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the journey started when I was 15 years old playing ice hockey, uh, about 105 pounds soaking wet. Right. And um, kept getting the crap beaten out of it. I was generally quicker than most other kids. Yep. Uh, but if they caught me with a body check, they'd knock me on my butt pretty quick. So I started lifting weights, and very quickly I started to enjoy lifting weights a lot more than I enjoyed playing team sports. You know, if I, if I am honest with myself, I always played for the name on the back of the jersey, not the front. Um, you know, I wanted to score goals. I never played defense. Like I was that kind of guy. So it makes sense that I, I'd like weightlifting. And when I turned 18, I mean, I was studying kinesiology at the University of Western Ontario, where both of us went to school. Yep. And I was 18 years old. They had two free personal training sessions at that point for all students. Mm -hmm. I took the first one. I was like, I can be a personal trainer. Um, I became a personal trainer about two weeks after my 18th birthday, was a personal trainer at the University Sports and Rec Complex from second to fourth year. And when I graduated university, I mean, I wanted to go to medical school. I wanted to do a PhD in muscle phys. Like, that was always my path. Like most people who become trainers, I was like, I'm going to do this because it's kind of fun, and then I'm going to figure out what I want to do with my life. 
started training full time in Toronto, enjoyed it. Hit the point at 23 years old where I was doing about as good as I could do as a trainer. I was, I was charging as much as I could in Toronto. It's full of clients, about 40 out, 40 client hours a week. I was making a commission from referring my overload of clients to other trainers, and I was managing a group of 10 trainers at 23 years old. Um, and it was cool. It was fun at the time. I was making good money, but I remember I was still playing ice hockey at this point at night, and I got slew-footed. I got tripped one night, and I pulled my hamstring, and I was out of commission for two weeks off my feet. And, and I didn't make money for two weeks. And I was like, shit. Like, yeah. is this what my life is going to be like? Like, what what next? Sometimes you and need a kick in the ass to, to stimulate action, right? And it wasn't that big of a kick in the ass. I mean, I, was a, I had a pulled hamstring for two weeks. Right. Like, it wasn't that bad. But you can't, you but can't make money. You can't make money. Mm-hmm. And I was 23 years old, and I was like, okay, well, what next in the fitness career? And that's a very scary thing to do. So... Um, long story short, I started researching a lot about multiple income streams, how to make money in a service industry, not on your feet, yada, yada, yada. Came across something called Infopreneuring in a book called Multiple Streams of Income by Robert G. Allen. Basically said, write a book. So at 24 years old, I wrote a book to educate personal trainers because I was too ignorant not to, which I think is the biggest major lesson. I think a what lot of people- What was the first book, Jonathan? Ignite the Fire. Ignite the Fire. Okay. Uh, I think a lot of people don't take action on things these days, quite frankly, because so they know true. too much about it. And so, yeah. um, so I call it the ignorance quotient, like yeah, paralysis how stupid by analysis, right? you need to be about something. Yeah. Um, so, so I wrote Ignite the Fire, came out about 25 years old, and I was like, I need people to buy this book. How do I build up a network to buy this book of mine uh, as an ignorant 24, 25-year-old that wrote a book to educate an industry because um, he had the gumption to do so. And, uh, and long story short, started uh, the Personal Trainer Development Center based around the idea that uh, if, if, if I can put out one good idea or two good ideas a year, there's probably a lot of other people who can put out one or two good ideas a year. Let's get them all on the same platform, help everybody win by being a part of this thing. Um, well, kind of increasing my expert status as a result. And, and we did that. The personal trainer development center has evolved into the largest collaborative blog in the world for trainers. Um, ignite the fire is now in a revision. It's being translated Chinese. It's in Spanish. It's used in colleges and mentorships around the world. Um, and, and the rest is kind of history. Um, I trained for another about two years and then dove deep into, I guess, internet entrepreneurship, uh, yeah. education. I don't know. I don't know what I'd call myself specifically, but, uh, but that's, that's the story, man. It's well, ultimately kind of every, no plan. Yeah. Every business person needs to evolve online. You know, the, the newest catchphrase that is internet entrepreneurship. But the reality is if you're not an inter- internet entrepreneur, you're kind of screwed because, it's the direction of the world, right? So it's, it's necessity. Right. So it's pretty awesome to see that you've taken your passion and your interest and, and turned it into something that's massively applicable for everybody else. And, and the reason I think this is super cool is you've kind of attached to the catchphrase of the highly wealthy online trainer. And that's an awesome catchphrase <laughs> because most trainers I know, their only marketing strategy is I'm going to post a, a snapshot, a screenshot on Instagram of, hey, I'm now taking on clients. And that's yeah, their right. strategy, man. So, and that's that's the reality, right? You know, every pro bodybuilder comes to me and goes, hey, man, how do we get more online clients? Or, hey, man, how do I build a business? And that, that's their strategy. So if I just post this picture of me in really good shape, that's my credentials and that's my, my, my credibility. Uh, and I'm just right. going to try to start taking on clients. And they'll get one or two or maybe they'll get five or ten. And it ends there. So... Um, I'd love for you to start, um, you know, walking us down the path of what you suggest people do, because I know you've got a, a tremendous resource, um, you know, the online trainer resource. Um, what are you suggesting people do? And I know you've got two new books that, that you sell in tandem that are they're really guiding people down this journey of, um, hey, man, here's how you take your interest and your passion in training, which is, you know, what I'm good mm-hmm. at manifesting and turning that into a business of, hey, let's take this this passion, this interest, and teach you how to make money. Sure. It's, it, there are two fundamental principles. Um, the first is, how would this look like if it were easy? Mm-hmm. And the second is two golden rules for success, which number one is do a great job. Number two is make sure everybody knows about it. So so we'll go on, on the second fundamental principle, which is how do you make sure everybody knows about how great you are? And it's all surrounded by becoming the guy. The guy is a gender neutral term. Everybody yeah. wants to be the guy. Everybody wants to recommend the guy. I always say that I call you the mayor, right? Become the mayor of bodybuilding. Become the mayor of muscle execution. That, that's always what I, that's my. Become synonymous my with it. Yeah. 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 Become synonymous with it. Yeah. The mayor. And so the mayor is gender neutral as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and so, so how do you become the guy? 
is is the question. I think what you described, you know, somebody posting up a, a tip on bodybuilding and saying I'm taking on clients, that's a tactic. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with tactics. Um, but tactics are, are come today, gone tomorrow. And if you're like, oh, Facebook likes video today. Oh, oh, there's Periscope. Oh, there's Snapchat. Oh, there's whatever. It's like if you try to keep up, you're always going to be two steps behind. Right. If you understand fundamentally why people use social networks and how you can get them to um, to to want to share messages as a way as an extension of themselves, you're always going to be. But it doesn't matter what the platform is. The platform will change. Um, so it's a matter of saying, okay, what's my overall strategy? What do you want people to do? What do you want people to know about you? And then you can kind of fit in those individual tactics to right. that. Um, you also hit on, Ben, the idea of like, oh, maybe they'll get one or two or five clients. Um, there's basically three categories of clients that you can get. We'll call them fast lane, slow lane, medium lane clients. The fast lane clients is the low-hanging fruit. These are people who either know you or for some reason really like you or feel connected with you mm -hmm. or they felt enough pain and they're ready to take action right now and you're just lucky that you happen to be there. Right. Right. It's a combination of those two. Mm -hmm. That's going to be generally about 5% of your client pool. Then you've got the medium lane clients who you kind of want to whine and dine a little bit. Those are the people who are probably going to, going to watch your content for a while. Um, they're going to kind of follow you if, if you can get a chance to be in front of them a bunch of times. Um, they, they kind of know that they want to take action. They just don't know if they're ready to quite yet or yeah. they don't know if they trust you yet. Yeah, it's like the, the hot girl in, in college who, you know, you have to kind of woo them a little bit, you know, just go and go, hey, like, will you have sex with me or will you marry me? It's like, hey, I have to walk you down this journey of sure. like, hey, let's become friends. Hey, let's show you that I'm not the bad person. You know what I mean? Like, let, let's, and if you let's... ask enough people, one of them will probably say yes. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, sure. But most won't, and the good ones will. Yeah, exactly. It'll <laughs> never be the ones you want. That's right. It'll be uh, never yeah. be the ones you want to keep for life. And that's ultimately what we're after is how do we get those clients that not only are going to be, uh, you know, paying clients, but are they going to be clients for life? And, you know, I, mm -hmm. the joke I always make on social media is the people who are my biggest haters to begin with end up being my best customers long term because it takes the longest time for you to kind of convince them of your integrity and your value. And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, my God, this guy's the best. So how do we walk mm -hmm. them down that path? And anytime you can you can connect with somebody really emotionally, either positive or negative, mm -hmm. they're very connected with mm -hmm. you. So if somebody, it, it's kind of like an inverted you or like an inverted horseshoe. Mm -hmm. Like somebody who absolutely hates you uh, is actually very close to somebody who absolutely loves you on the opposite end of the spectrum. If you look at, at one of my books, Viralnomics, if you look at the logo, um, you'll actually see on either side of the V, um, there's, there's individual points that break off of it and they each break off in two points. And that's meant to signify the same thing with the V positive and negative emotions. And that's all of the research that's comes out, that's come out about social contagion theory and, and word of mouth theory, um, it, it, it is based, is predicated on that idea is, um, you need a positive and negative emotion. Um, neither like, like somebody who's just kind of okay with you is, is where ideas go to die. And so how do you get a positive or negative emotion? You're right. Your, your best followers by far are going to be people who hate you at the beginning um, because you, you've connected with them enough mm -hmm. to get that. So, so your question is how do you get this? Um, that's something that I've dwelled upon a lot in the last year or so because I think it's changed quite a bit, and I'll explain a little bit why. Um, the, the entire online marketing ecosystem has become decentralized there there's you're, you're kind of on your own um you know facebook ad spend has gone up and is going to continue to go up organic reach on all social media platforms has gone down i don't care what platform comes out it might be hot for a little bit then it's then reach is going to go down email deliverability is going down as well and so it's harder and harder to reach the inbox it used to be get the emails you own the leads it's like yeah you own the leads but you don't own the place where the emails go to so what do you do and, and my answer for this is, number one, you hedge yourself, um, and, and you probably want to be like, I'm basically using Facebook groups and email in tandem, um, and I'm just trying to spin people back and forth between the two. And, and I'm not a showy guy. Like, you might do, you might do Instagram if, if you're somebody who, who looks good and, and your business is based off of how you look. That's not really me. My business is based off of me not owning shoes, owning one pair of jeans, and owning one T-shirt. Um, the, the other piece of the puzzle is how do you get as many exposures as you need for somebody to trust you and how do you stick around for long enough so that when they're ready to buy, 
you're the one who they buy from. Right. And I think that's that's the biggest thing. I mean, marketing now has become marketing used to be basically you throw out an ad or you throw out a marketing message, you try to stop people where they are, reverse them, get them to pay attention to you. Marketing now, in the words of Mark Earls, who's who's an economist in the UK, is is a matter of curating diffusion. How do you figure out where people are already going and diffuse seamlessly into that mm-hmm. and become a part of the conversation for a long period of time? And and I think you do that. You do that by getting materials in their hands that they want to talk about and that they want to display. This is why I'm so bearish on books. People don't throw out books, man. You get a book on somebody's shelf, it sits there. It sits there for forever. Years. Yep. And, I mean, I'll tell you, so, there's books that I bought three and four years ago that I just actually, there's one book that was giving me, it's a perfect example. It was given me in 2013, and I looked at it, and I was like, no. Nah. And I picked it yeah. up again recently, and I was like, and I've, I've been reading it, and I'm like, this is the best book I've ever had. I wish I had read it four years ago, but it sat there. And I didn't know until yeah. I saw the title pop up somewhere again. You're absolutely right of books. Books are amazing. I mean, I was given a book. I still remember this. It's like five months ago, a fulfillment company I used to do sent us out a free book by somebody. It was one of their other clients. They sent us out a free book in the mail. The book was shit. It was like the worst book I've ever read. And, and, and we were moving out of a place that we were living in. And I had this book in my hand, and it was so hard for me to throw it out. <laughs> yeah. I could not throw out this book. It right. was shit. This book was terrible, and I couldn't throw it out. Hmm. And I kept it. I still have it. Why? I'm not going to give it to anybody, but it's going to be on my shelf. Now, of course, you want your book to be good. Right. Um, but but even if it's not, my question is, you know, you go back to, like, how do you get people to to trust you enough to buy? Or how do you stay in the conversation long enough so that when they're ready to buy, you're the person that they think about? Which I think is, is the biggest thing. I think what a lot of fitness marketers don't realize is that the reason that somebody purchases is not because they're not ready. It's not, be, or it's not because they're cheap. It's not because... They don't trust you it's because they're not ready. Um, they've tried. They've probably tried and failed multiple times to do Love exactly it. what you're promising to teach them yep. over and over and over again with the instruction of other people who promised them almost the exact same thing as you. Dude, that's so, so brilliant. So what you're giving them so is brilliant. trust. Yep. Yeah. And how do you do that? you just got to be there. It's, it's an idea called cognitive ease. The more time somebody sees something, the more trustworthy they believe that that thing is and the more important they think that that thing is. Man, it's brilliant. How do you get that? You get that by getting yourself in front of them over, what and I teach, over and over and over and over again. Yeah, what I teach at MI40 is ultimately like exercise execution is the solution to all your body problems. And people are like, well, you know, people are like, ah, I'm not so sure. I've, I've improved my execution before. didn't really do anything. And I just keep mm-hmm. sticking with it and be like, listen, guys, if you, if you improve it, if you improve it, if you improve it, your body will change, your, your margin for error, your nutrition will change, you will become mindful in your life because you have to pay attention to every mindful detail. People don't doubt that I'm the king of exercise execution. What they doubt is that exercise execution is the solution to the problems. And, and that's exactly what you're saying. That's exactly what and, you're and saying. And so, so how do, you, how do you, you get that message to stick? Man, what are some of your ways to do that? Ultimately, personally, like it's just a matter of social proof. It's just like, you know, sticking with it. And, and people will eventually, I think for everyone to tangibly feel something is where they really get the, that goods that stick in their brains. So, you know, people come to our camps or, or I try to give them tactile cues on YouTube videos or, or Instagram videos or whatever it is. And once they feel it and they're like, oh, my God, I've never felt anything like that before. And they start to just kind of go down that journey. Once you, Once they open their eyes to the idea that it's possible – their life changes. Um, and, but that's, yeah. that's literally exactly what you're talking about, right? Most people just aren't ready to hear it. Like the solution is there. They've tried this solution so many other times and it just hasn't worked. It's not the same solution, but they, they think they've tried it so many other times. It's speaking to what you're saying. And ultimately the message you're conveying, Jonathan, is it's the long haul. That's what I love, man, as I love the, your, your, your business is built around, hey, man, it's, you're not the shiny red object. How do you build, and this is where I want to progress our talk to here, is how do you build the business in the long haul and this is what you're doing for yourself and this is what it sounds like you're teaching your students to do is building mm-hmm. building the 10-year building the 25-year plan and that's how you build a business right like most guys are trying to make money sure. today because i need to pay my bills at the end of the month whereas you're setting it up from a perspective of hey man how do i build an empire and and is, is that am i correct in making that assumption yeah i mean it's, it's definitely the long game um, one of the things that you said that I really want to go back to them because I think it was a brilliant point is it's possible. Yeah. Uh, how do you get somebody to to 
to commit to something that you want them or that you think that they need to commit to that they've tried and failed with previously? Um, the answer is it's possible. And, and how do you do that? A lot of people try to do too much. From a fitness standpoint, what you said is, is, is dead on, I think, Ben. Um, can you give them that one cue that's going to get them to feel something a little bit different? That they're going to say, holy crap, like this is it. Once you get that buy-in, then, then the waterfall effect mm -hmm. kind of happens. Yeah. Um, with online marketing, you, you get this with lead magnets, for example. Um, a lead magnet is is generally the first thing. For anybody who doesn't know, a lead magnet is like whenever somebody says, I'll give you this in exchange for your address. That's a lead magnet or ethical bribe or you can content upgrade. You can call it a bunch of different things. Um, for the most part, it's usually a PDF. The good ones are PDFs. Um, the bad ones are like webinars and three-part video series and stuff like that. And the reason that the good ones are PDFs is that they're simple and their only job is to get you to take one step forward mm -hmm. in the direction that you want to go. Yep. It's easy. It's short. It should be consumed within four to seven minutes. Its only job is to say, here's where you are. Here's where you ultimately want to go. I'm going to prove to you that I can help you. And I'm going to prove to you that it's possible by helping you take one step in that direction. And that's the job of, of that lead magnet. So I just wanted to, to really hit on that because I think that was – it's such a cool point. It's, it's so interesting to me when you can look at – when you can look at how industries overlap and you can get that beautiful synergy in between. It's like a Venn diagram. Like the overlap is what matters. Individual industries, individual thought processes are really boring. Um, so – you know, giving the speak, giving the listeners some action items right now. I'm thinking. So, would your first um, task, your suggested task, look like, hey, go out and create a lead magnet that allows people to take that first step, or would you look at it from a perspective of, hey, create your 10 year plan, write your book, and then get people mm -hmm. into this funnel? So, no. guys who are sitting out there who are like, hey, man, like I, I want to create a business. And, you know, what's, what's the next way in, from your perspective for them to take that leap? That's a good question. Um, I'm glad you asked that, Ben. It's, it's neither of those things. Um, the first step is to eliminate fear. Uh, Seneca once said, if you wish to stave off all fear, imagine that the worst that can happen most definitely will happen. Fear is nothing but an irrational response to the unknown. The book right there. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Perfect. So, so fear is the unknown. So if you make the unknown known, then you don't have fear. If you want to take action, you've got to eliminate fear. You've got to take the first step. The way to do that is to make very clearly known how much money you need. This is, this is something that is so obvious and so few people do it. Um, it's as simple as write down on a piece of paper how much money you need each month to basically survive, make sure any dependents of yours are looked after, pay all your bills you need to do. And if you have anything really special that you don't want to give up, like in my budget, when I did it, I, I had a um, $200 dollars do something special for my girlfriend fund, who's now my wife, who you know. Uh, wh whatever that is, make a realistic number. I mean, it shouldn't be like frivolous, but, but make a realistic number. Um, then you want to subtract from that number the amount of money you're making doing things that are either completely passive or doing things that, that you would do until the day you die, even if nobody paid you. That number might be zero. There might be a number there. Whatever's left now, I call your freedom number. That's your monthly revenue that you need to hit. Your next job is to do whatever you can do that's as high yield as possible to get to that number. That's probably going to be coaching. That's probably going to be service-based stuff. I get it. It's not scalable. It's not passive, blah, 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 blah. Your only job right now is to get to that. So if your number is $3,000 and you want to charge $300 a month for coaching, you need 10 clients. Your only job now, get 10. absurd focus, is yeah. to get 10 clients who are going to pay you $300 a month. Because once you get that, you're free. Freedom is providing yourself the opportunity to fail. Now you've got space. Now you can give away all of the other stuff you're doing that's annoying. Now you can, now you can say, okay, well, now I have the mental clarity, which I think a lot of things that, that people take for granted is, is how important willpower is and creative energy and mental clarity. Now your, your brain can relax and say, okay, I'm taken care of and the people I love are taken care of because I've got this. Now, with all of my other spare time, I can start putting the pieces together. And yeah, exactly. The pieces are probably going to be some combination of creating intellectual property for sale, whether it's a book, whether it's a course, something that's scalable and something that can become passive at one point. Um, even before then, like affiliate stuff, if you want to do it, if you really believe in a company, create a funnel for an affiliate product before you create your own product. 
just so you have that other that other revenue source in there. Um, and then and then you start kind of stacking onto it. My friend Steph Joanne calls it the octopus. Basically, you have your main thing, and then you just keep feeding different lead generation techniques. That's all your social media stuff. That's all your lead magnet stuff. That stuff comes after. And and by the way, um, paid advertising comes like way at the far end of all of this. Paid advertising is gasoline onto a fire. If there's no fire, you're just pouring gasoline onto a pile of logs. So, man, you're, you're obviously a reader, and I want to uh, ask this question because I know a lot of people are out there going, well, I don't really know what to create my business around. So either do you have a method whereby you say, hey, like, here's how you find what your passion is. So, you know, I'm, I, I own exercise execution. Like, that's my objective is, like, I'm the guy. If you want to learn how to exercise, I'm your guy. Uh, and, and that's the end of it, right? Most people go, well, I don't really know what I'm good at. Um, do you have a method or do you have books that you might recommend for people finding um, what they love? Or what do you recommend? Because that's obviously um, step one, right? Don't create a business you don't love. Don't create a business you don't love. Um, I don't have a method for you. I wish I did because that would have saved There's me a hell of a lot of time. <laughs> My method is to jump so deep into an idea Um do a great job investigating and producing something on that idea and then leaving it out in the world and then moving it on to the How do you next. overcome the fear? Is it just what Seneca says? Like, assume worst case scenario, you've got your butt covered and, and then jump in? I assume the worst case scenario. I, the, the easiest thing that I do is I, no matter what I'm going to do, if I need to make a decision, I imagine the absolute worst case scenario that's going to happen. Um, if nobody buys this book, if it, if it crashes and burns, um, how much time is it going to take me? How much money am I going to spend at it? What's the potential reputation cost mm -hmm. of, of this thing, I think, is also very important. Am I willing to live with the worst case scenario? If I'm willing to work with it, then yeah. Um, I mean, we have a lot of years. Uh, there, there's kind of this like cult of immediacy that I think a lot of younger entrepreneurs especially yes. fall prey to. We have a lot of years, man. You can produce a lot of stuff. Since the age of 25, I've written seven books, created... Uh, a certification. I've put on three conferences. I've produced something like 16 DVDs. Um, and you know what? Like a lot of them aren't for sale anymore and a lot of them were bad. So what? Good for you, man. Some of them were really good. Uh, it's, it's kind of the idea. I, I always love what, you know, investigating what like really popular people are doing. Like Gary Vaynerchuk's a perfect example. Um, throw as much crap at the wall as you possibly can. And when you figure out what sticks, you double down on that. Interesting perspective. So I don't, I don't have a process. Yeah, I don't have yeah. a process. I mean, that's not. I'm not saying that this is a good answer. This is, this is what I've always done. Um, I just produce, man. I put stuff out into the world. I see what people respond to. I see what people don't respond to. I see what lights me up, um, and I build businesses around that. I'm really, really good at writing books, and so I've turned my company into a publishing company. I love it. I'm really bad at coming out with an idea and running it for a long period of time and growing it slowly, so I'm not building a startup. Um, um, I tried. It was miserable. I wasted a lot of money. So, so the book you, the two books that you have right now on OnlineTrainer.com, if anyone wants to check that out, they can get these two books. Um, the first one being Habits of Highly Wealthy Online Trainers. Tell me about that book. That book was written, um, so, so this is another interesting, like failing yourself to success. Um, those books were originally going to be a four part series that was going to be a free extra bonus as part of a paid print newsletter subscription. Um, they, I started writing them and I absolutely loved them and realized that they were their own project mm -hmm. and the print newsletter has never happened and might never happen. Um, and it's become two books and not four books. And I struggled with that. I, there were a lot of nights where I was just trying to figure out what the heck to do with all this stuff that I had and how to organize it. Um, but the idea with, with having book number one is habits is if you don't have good habits, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. I could tell you whatever you want to know about marketing. It doesn't matter if you're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, the best marketing in the world is stuff that you, that you believe in. It's deep strategy and you do it consistently over a relatively long period of time. It's not one done, I'm going to shoot a Facebook ad to a 15-minute strategy call uh, to a $5,000 coaching program. Like, that's not marketing. And, you know, the parallel is drawn there from life and your body and fitness are massive, right? Huge. So 
huge. Yeah, and that, that's so the realization you make the further you go into business is like it's just all the same thing, man. If Whether you're going to have to learn lessons in the gym and in fitness or you learn lessons in business, you're going to get slapped in the face. You're going to learn somehow. So apply the lessons you learn here to the lessons there. Um, so what are the habits of highly online or highly wealthy online trainers? The habits are respecting your time. The habits are learning how to write. The habits are um, something called choice minimalism. How often do people need to write? Huge. How often do people think, need to write? I, I, well, so here's one of the central tenets of the book is um, I totally I, – I look at online training as something that's, that's a stepping stone. Um, some people will be online trainers for the rest of their life. Like, dude, I'm honest. Odds are you're not going to be an online trainer for the rest of your life. I will be doing you a disservice if I only if I profess to teach you marketing right. and branding and how to live your life, and I'm only doing it specific to online training. I want to teach you transferable skills that you can take with you whatever you want to do. So I think that learning how to write and effectively communicate through the written word is the most valuable skill anybody can have. Yeah, and reward. You can hire right? somebody to write your sales copy. Yeah. Fine. You still need to be able to write a status update. You still need to be able to write an email to your client or write an email to a friend or whatever. Um, and oh my God, people are bad writers, man. Look in the comment thread of any Facebook post anywhere. It's it's bad. Do you have tools <laughs> or are you just an avid reader and, and your writing skills develop from that? Or do you have courses or things you recommend to upgrade? Because, I mean, I'm an avid re a reader and writer, man. I write at least an hour, sometimes up to five, six hours a day, but I still don't think by any stretch am I a great writer. Um, what are your recommendations for people to really pull out that um, creative process? I think that anybody who writes a significant amount realizes that. I, I, I think that the more you write, the more you realize how bad of a writer you are. So <laughs> I like how you said that. You're probably a great writer by most people's standards, um, but but by your standards, you're a terrible writer. You, know, you can always be better, uh, and, right? Like and, everything. Sure. And the more you write, the worse you're going to think that you are. Um, <laughs> that's just why most writers end up in basements drinking bourbon all the time, um, disgruntled. Yeah. Or in Costa so, Rica with no shoes. Yeah, basically, or in Costa Rica <laughs> with no shoes. Right. Um, no, there are, there are two kind of seminal works that I always recommend to people. There's On Writing Well by Zinsler, um, is, is I think, probably the most important book for what was learning his name? how to write. Zinser, I think it's Z I N S S E R. It's William Zinser. It's called On Writing Well. And what that really, really hammers in is the importance of succinctness and clarity and writing for your reader and not writing for other people that you want to impress, i.e., your colleagues, which is something very important in the fitness industry. Um, and then the other book is The Elements of Style by, by Strunk and White. Um, and that book, I mean, it's maybe I'm just a dork, but I actually enjoyed reading it. But it's about a lot of grammar and punctuation principles. Mm -hmm. um, but what I really liked about it is it wasn't like, here's, a, here's how you use a comma or a semicolon or anything like that. It was like, here's how you actually use these devices to have better, better effect. Mm -hmm. um, I love, for example, I absolutely love cadence in writing. I think that words matter, and I think that the way that words are organized communicates more. Mm -hmm. I can get somebody's heart pumping by how I arrange the words and by how long or short or powerful the way that the sentence is organized is without the words. It could be any words. Right. If I want to exhaust the reader, I will write a run-on sentence. And you'll see that sometimes in my books, and I work with the same editors now, um, and, and they leave it because they now recognize when I'm doing it. And they'll write me a little like smiley face. They're like run-on sentence on purpose, smiley face. Um, so, so elements of style kind of kind of works with that a lot. Cool. Um, the cadence, alliteration, all of those tools that that are just super super powerful to use. Um, so writing's really big in terms of a habit. And then this choice minimalism thing is big. Yeah, I think talk to minimizing me about that. decisions you need to make is is so freaking important. Like, Love that. I own one T-shirt. This is the only t-shirt I own. I own six in black, two in navy, two in gray. Um, <laughs> we live a parallel life, man. The, <laughs> well, right. Like, yeah. what's the what's the um, and and I'll give my buddy a, a a bit of a a bit of a promotion here at uh, Unbound Marina, is is the company. It's it's a fantastic company, but the the idea behind that is quite simple. It's what's the utility of a decision that you're making? What's the desired outcome? Right. 
take stock in that. My desire to, I mean, if I love fashion, it would be different. I don't. My desired outcome is to, is to feel good and feel like I look good in what I wear. Is wearing a different brand t-shirt going to affect my desired outcome? No. So I'm going to wear the same brand t-shirt and the same t-shirt every day. That way I don't need to make that decision. And, and how many little decisions, seemingly obtuse decisions that you can eliminate in your everyday life, um, that just leaves you more room to think about the important things. Do you eat the same thing every day? I don't, but I also don't look at menus. And I, and I, when I do cook, I cook the exact same things. Um, but I don't look at menus. Like I'll walk in. So tell me some other things you're doing to eliminate decision fatigue. So, you know, you've, you have, you're modeling yourself, I don't know if intentionally, but after some massive um, personalities, obviously we know Steve Jobs, uh, Zuckerberg, um, another friend of mine, Dean Jackson. If you don't know Dean Jackson, it's the same way. He wears the same shirt and pants every day, man, same shoes. He's always got his chucks and his black long sleeve shirt. Um, so, and Obama's the same way. Oh, really? Interesting. So, man, tell me what other things you're doing, because I'm very interested in this. I mean, I, I'm very interested in the minimalist lifestyle and eliminating all this frivolous, useless attention to nonsense, right? Ultimately, like, I want to I want to focus my brain power on things that matter, um, which kids throws a complete wrench in that, by the way. But yeah, <laughs> we'll leave that does. alone. I, I know that. We'll leave that alone. Um, um, so what other things are you are you systematizing so that um, you can eliminate decision fatigue? I'll talk about a specific to business because um, I guess that, that that's more apt for this conversation. One is obviously a lot of filters around my email. So I have an email account that nobody knows about. That's not public anywhere. All of my emails get filtered to one of two different, one, one's an assistant, one's my project manager, depending on the idea. And I've built all the protocols for them to deal with basically all of the emails. And, and then we just add in a quick line. Somebody named Dan Martell was the one that introduced me to this. Um, he says, hey, it's Courtney. Um, I got to this email before John did, and I thought you'd appreciate a faster response. And then they respond to the email. Mm -hmm. So it's still very personal, and it's I like it because it's kind of voiced in a way that you're, you're doing them a solid. Yeah. Um, and, and so they'll sometimes forward me messages that, that they think that I want to see. But for the most part, I mean, I might get three emails a day. Like, what do you need to deal with? Um, I've, everything is an FAQ. Everything has an answer to it. All the administrative functions have kind of taken a step back and operated. So, so that's one. Um, the other is when it comes to social media, when it comes to blogging, when it comes to writing articles, just eliminating the crap, man. Um, the only thing that matters is the work. Nothing else matters. I don't have any stats in, even integrated. I don't have any stats even installed into any of my websites. I have no idea how many people visit my website. I have never done an A-B test in my life. Um, I've never measured anything. It's completely irrelevant to me because to me those are all kind of short-term things going for the biggest win possible versus trying so hard every day just to produce incredible work day in and day out. I look at people like Seth Godin. Um, Seth Godin still operates on TypePad, which most people don't even know exists. He's like 99.8% of their of their uh, uh, volume. You know, TypePad is, an, is a precursor to WordPress, is a precursor to Blogspot, right? Mm -hmm. And so he's on TypePad because there's no reason for him not to be. He, uh, he writes, an, he's written an article, something like every day for the last 10 years, he's published an article. And he's written a whole bunch of books and gotten a ton of books out. But what do you really notice that stands out about that? Um, he doesn't have an email list. His email list is an OSS feed. Of, so it's just like an automated feed of, of his articles that go out to anybody who subscribes to it. His articles also automatically post on social media accounts. Um, there's nothing else posted on the social media accounts. He doesn't answer any comments on any. He doesn't even look at the social media accounts. If you email him, he answers. But he doesn't pay attention to anything like that. Hmm. Um, I never use images anymore. Like I've just eliminated all of the crap that stops me from producing high-quality work. I don't write meta descriptions. I don't do any SEO work. I don't have any stats installed into my site. I don't do any A-B tests. Um, I, I don't, like, it's just the article gets out, I send it out in an email, and then somebody on my team syndicates it three days later on a couple of different platforms. That's it. And then I move on to the next. Man, and I, pay and I love to how that's doing once it's out into the world. I love how clear, and, and the message here for all the listeners is, 
get clear on who you are and what your objective is. And Jonathan is so clear on the fact that his uh, exclusive governing factor is I'm going to own content. I'm going to be an amazing writer and people are going to love me for my content, similar to Seth Godin. And some people out there don't have the capacity to do that, or at least not yet. Um, so they need tactics and they need A-B testing and they need to optimize every day. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I think that the best thing, the best message in what you've just said, from my perspective, is clarity on your end, your 10-year vision is you're going to be prolific for your quality of what you're putting out. Yeah. Brilliant. Prolific. 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 Yeah. Right. The goal, my goal in the back of my head has always been, um, I want to be able to send out an email that says, I will be here at this time, buy your ticket here, click. No sales copy, no fanfare, no, no, no pre-working people up, no nothing. Mm -hmm. Just people blindly trust me that I can send out that one email and sell out a 5,000 seat theater. I know we're close to that now. No, that's like, a good goal, man, I like that. Dude, Conan O'Brien sent out a tweet and in 20 minutes sold out a nationwide tour. Think about what needs to be in place for that to happen. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with social media, dude. Right. It has everything to do with the quality of work, the amount of assets that you've produced, the people you've impacted personally over such a long period of time, consistently over so many years. Brilliant. That's that's what matters. Brilliant. And that's power. That's power. And the, the simplicity is the brilliance, right? Is yes. the idea of so many people are thinking about all these tactics and what they have to do and how many posts they have to do and how many likes they get on the posts. And the reality is all that stuff is semantics and complete bullshit unless complete you're putting it's out... Irrelevant. Exactly. In clay, unless you're putting out great, valuable, yeah. uh, morally strong content. I love it, man. Yes. I love that we're having this conversation. This is brilliant. I think, I think one of our... John Brody is one of our mutual friends, mm -hmm. I think. Um, I had a very long lunch with him yesterday. He's 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 been a great friend and mentor to me for many years. And and one of the things that he said to me years back about testing was great. He said, a lot of people test C versus C plus ideas. And when you do that, the C plus idea is going to win out. But what you're not what you're doing is you're taking attention away from getting to an A idea. Once you have an A idea, then you can test it against an A plus idea. But ninety nine point nine 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 percent of people never get to the point where they have A ideas because you just haven't thought hard enough about it. They haven't spent enough time with it. Completely agree, man. And, uh, you know, I fight that, you know, it's the idea of, again, going back to paralysis by analysis. I fight that all the time with everything that I put out is like, I, I want to be so, I have such high levels of integrity and quality with what I put out. Sometimes I, I people are like, dude, why don't you put out more videos? Why don't you put out more articles? I'm like, well, because it needs to have a specific purpose it needs to have a specific outcome in mind, and I need to be helping a large number of people. It's not just about putting out superfluous, unnecessary, massive amounts of content. It's mm -hmm. like, wh what's the purpose? And, and sometimes I get ridiculed for like, hey, man, dude, you just got to put out more. But like yourself, <laughs> I, I, maybe I need to you know, hold my, foot, my, my feet to the fire with like putting it out daily. But at the same time, I'm always of the mentality of like, well, what, where's it going? And is it an A-plus idea or at least a, you know, a B-plus idea at very least, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, there's, there, there are certainly different schools of thought. Um, I'm, I'm of the opinion that whenever anybody sees my name, they have a pre-existing notion, and, and I'm not at this point yet, but this is, this is the goal. They have a pre-existing notion of exactly what type of quality it's going to be, and it stops them in their tracks because they know it's going to be worth looking at. Dude, I, I tell you, from my perspective, um, you're already doing that with your books. Uh, everything you're doing is very high quality. Um, you're doing a great job with all your websites. Like looking through your, your websites makes me know how much I need to upgrade my websites. Um, <laughs> Design doing, and branding, man. Yeah, dude, you're doing a fantastic job. Yeah. All the the, uh, the book covers, the, the quality of the content in the book, books are amazing. Uh, I want to plug this other you know book you're selling here on, on um, online trainer, which is the marketing breakthroughs of highly wealthy on, mm. uh, online uh, tr uh, trainers. Um, sure. One or two. You plug whatever you want in mind. I'm happy to. Yeah, yeah happy exactly, man. Well, because yeah, I think people fine. need this stuff, man. If people are trying to build a build a business, <laughs> these are these are really easy resources for them. Um, what are we talking about when we say breakthroughs? Breakthrough is just a way of thinking differently. What I really wanted to do with that book. So, so this comes as a two book box set mm -hmm. for anybody who doesn't know. Um, you can't buy one without the other. You can't do marketing without habits. Right. I, so I'm forcing that. Yep. 
Um, and, and that was very purposeful. A breakthrough is a way of thinking differently. A breakthrough is not a tactic. A breakthrough is a strategy. It's a mindset. And so, for example, and, and a lot of people will read that book and they'll be like, oh, he's going to tell me when to post on Facebook. It's like, nah, I'm not going to tell you that. I can tell you exactly when to post on Facebook according to science, according to research. It's not going to make an inch of a difference in the right. business. What I'm going to tell you is the importance of defining industry norms. What I'm going to tell you is the importance of avoiding things like marketing incest, not copying others. Because mm -hmm. when you start to really get into the thick of it, you realize that most people out there don't know what the heck they're doing. They're just copying other people. So if you're copying them, it's, it's like it's like back in the day. I mean, you've got young kids. It's like Purple Monkey Dishwasher, if you ever played that game, where there would be a bunch of kids in a schoolroom, and somebody would whisper something in the ear of one kid, and that message would have to try to try to be communicated as a whisper to the final kid in the line right. without changing. Yeah. And it always changes and eventually turns into something like Purple Monkey Dishwasher. Right. It's that's marketing incest. Yep. Um, and and understanding that most of the time when people are educating others about what to do when it comes to marketing or, or, or building, or particularly in an on by online business, um, what they're doing is they're teaching you a system that can be taught. And I think that's a very important thing to understand. A system that can be taught is something that can be wrapped up into a neat little ball with a nice little hook and positioned properly with a really easy overnight benefit. If somebody says, I just did this one thing and I got all the success, they're lying, they're disillusioned, or they got lucky. Right. Um, it's not something that can that can maintain. Um, but those are the like like if it was easy to do that, everybody would be doing it. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So so those are the types of things that that can be taught. And that are commonly taught. And I think that that's very important to understand. So, <clears throat> so the idea of, of the marketing breakthroughs is, is let's insert marketing into every part of your business. Even things like micro changes. Changing how often you charge, for example. You can charge somebody bi-weekly versus monthly. And you can add. I mean, it, we've done the calculations. You can add over $20,000, $25,000 to your bottom line after a couple years. Because... Bi-weekly is 28 days. Monthly is 30.42 days. Oh, sorry. The average month is 30.42 days. Bi-weekly is 28 days yeah. in, in a non-leap year. Um, micro changes in terms of how you, how you present your services is very important. So when somebody gets to a page, you can very easily present an upsell that you think is important. Let's say that, you, that you're selling training, and, and originally you were just going to sell a monthly training package. So you would say, here's your monthly training package, whatever, 200 bucks a month, 300 bucks a month. Um, here's what you get. Boom, 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 boom. Well, the sale stops at that point. What if you were to say, step one, pick your, or, or step one, fill out this form. Step two, fill out your, or, or, or choose the supplement that best fits you. Step three, pick your monthly training package. What you're doing now is you're, you're taking advantage of, of this um, heuristic, of this of this rule of thumb that makes it seem like there's a pre-existing behavior that should be copied. And, and humans are individual unless they are in a place where they assume that pre-existing behaviors already exist. So by saying step one, step two, step three, what you do is you kind of make it seem like they should take all these steps in order to get what they want. Mm -hmm. And now you've all of a sudden, I mean, you have to obviously believe in the supplement you're selling them and that it's going to help. And, and this could be supplements, could be equipment, could be any of a number of things. Um, but all of a sudden now you're just adding dollars to your bottom line. It has nothing to do with marketing. You can make more money three ways. You can get more clients, you can make more per transaction, or you can get more transactions per customer. So you can get more clients, you can raise prices, or you can sell the same people more things. Mm -hmm. Most people focus on getting more clients. The other two are probably much more important. All right, so I think the one thing that I want to wrap with here, and I think this is going to be a big one for people, is, and this may take longer than a minute, but um, <laughs> what what is the process that people should walk through to start writing a book? Because I know you're an advocate of, like, let, let's, let's bookify this stuff. Hey, man, let, we, we, we're, you don't, ending this? we're ending with this right now. Well, you don't, okay. <laughs> you don't have to give them the whole process, sure. but maybe – 
simplify it in you know the easiest way you can because this is a big one because I'm really a big believer and I'm in the process of writing two books right now two huge projects which are okay. taking up my entire life <laughs> but it's fun man I wake up every day you know at 4 a.m excited to write for three hours before I leave my house kind of thing um and I, I'm not going to share my process because I think yours is probably a lot more detailed and complete than mine but I'd love to hear um, what your simplified version of, of, you know, maybe where it's evolved from in the beginning, where when you first wrote your first book to where it is now after your seventh, um, or what you've identified as being the easiest way to actually get a book from in your brain onto paper and published. Sure. Um, there's no easy way. Uh, Lou Schuler, a very good friend of mine, probably the most prolific fitness author, of our time. I mean, he was an editor at Men's Health, a teen nation at Muscle and Fitness, and has written about 10 books for Rodale. Uh, once told me, he, he wrote the foreword for one of my books, and, and he once told me, any writer who tells you that it's easy is lying or a shitty writer, because it's not. It's, it, it's easy to talk about things the way that you understand them. It's ungodly difficult to talk about things so that somebody else can understand. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the hard thing. Um, so, so it's not easy, um, and it shouldn't be. I, I guess I'll, I'll give you a couple points that I think kind of sum up my thoughts on writing books now. One is that my books keep getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, Mug Twain once said, sorry, I didn't have more time or else I would have written you a shorter letter. Uh, the, these two books that I came out with that you mentioned, the, the Highly Wealthy Online Trainer box set, were originally about 100 pages more each, and they got cut. Bionomics, one of my other books, was 88,000 words, got published at 23. Wow. That's your and doing or your so editors? That's that's a combination of both. Mm -hmm. um, I think hiring the best editor you could possibly find is probably one of the most important things you can yeah. do. Which is a very hard thing to do. Which is a very hard thing to do. Um, the the final piece of it, or I guess the most actionable thing that I can give you for writing a great book is, and, and to simplify it as much as possible, is to say one book, one idea. Um, a lot of people know a lot of things. You know a lot, Ben. You could probably write a hundred books with what you know. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest problem, and and with the proliferation of self-publishing, you see this problem a lot more. Most self-public books are really, really bad, and it's not because the writing is bad. It's not because the ideas are bad. It's because the author has tried to do too much. It's it's one book, one idea, one theory, one theme. Everything in that book fits back to that theme and that idea. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't. You cut it out, you do as Stephen King says, you kill your babies, you cut it out, and you leave it for another book. Um, I think that that's the most important thing. So then the process becomes, okay, what's this, what's this topic I want to talk about? What's the one big idea? What's the one theme? Every nonfiction book has a theme the same as a fiction book has. Any good nonfiction book has a theme the same as a fiction book has. What's the theme? What's everything that I know about the topic? Write that down on a separate piece of paper. That'll take you a lot of time. But everything that you know about the topic, I use cue codes, and I use a program called Scrivener, which is just writing software, which makes it really easy. Sorry, um, what's it called? Scrivener? Scrivener. S-C-R-I-V-E-N-E-R. -E -E Scrivener. Um, it, it just allows you to organize really complicated projects really easily, mm -hmm. much better than Microsoft Word. But I use cue codes, like old school. Um, and write down everything you know about a topic, and then it's just a matter of cutting out anything that doesn't fit into that one idea, that one theme. Mm -hmm. And then the next stage is, of course, the research. Find a story to back up this. Find research to back it up. If you can't find research or if the research disproves it, um, then you got to deal with that. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can do what a lot of people do these days and find one obscure study that kind of mentions it but doesn't back up what you said and kind of bank on people not actually reading the study. Um, and still include it in the book, which is pretty common. Or you can you can admit that you actually might not have understood this fully and kind of rework it. Especially um, in the fitness industry, that's very common, right? Yeah, I'm not naming any names. Right. But, uh, but we can all think of a couple sure, off yeah. the top of our head yeah, where yeah. somebody has 50 research articles to back up a claim and you're reading through them and you're like, none of these even mention what they were talking <laughs> not about. Not even close, right? <laughs> like, right. <laughs> Or like, like I read this one study that does mention it, and it actually disproves what he said. Right. Um, so that's pretty common. So, so anyway, I mean, Ben, that's that's the best that I can give you in a very short period of time in terms of writing a book. I mean, then it's just a matter of putting pen to paper. There are 
there are two basic kinds of writers. There's the writer who edits as they write. They write very slowly. They edit every word as they write it. And then there's the writer who pukes everything down on paper and then edits down afterwards. Right. I'm the latter. Um, so, but recognizing what type of writer you are and, and working within that is important can, as well. You, that's great. And can you give me some some guidelines around how maybe you structure your writing? Like, do you plan it to do the same time every day? Do you have some rituals around that stuff? Because I think that's where people get par paralyzed. And I used to be the same way. It's like making time, planning time to, to write. And is it just something that you say, hey, I, I have this book plan, I have this deadline, and to do this, I need to know I, I know I need to write three to four hours a day, so I block out this time and that's all I do? Or do you just write when, when it comes to you? Um, three to four hours a day is very daunting to me. Uh, actually, habit number one in the habits book is 30 minutes of proactive work every single day. 30 minutes to move your business forward every single day. That's mm -hmm. it. Plan for it the night before, and I, I tell you how you basically plan for it the night before. I do it first thing in the morning. Most people that I know are, are like you and I. We wake up before anybody, before our families, mm -hmm. uh, first thing in the morning, and, and we do that really important work. Now, there are some writers who do it overnight, um, but I say 30 minutes every single day of proactive work. For me, that's almost always writing, um, but in a business, it might not be necessarily writing at every point in time. And then... My method is is I have these cue codes that I've written all the subjects, all the section heads on. And on each cue code is basically the title of the section, any writing prompts, any stories, um, any point forms. And I have all of them on the right side of my computer. Um, you ever you ever seen the marshmallow test? You know, the Mishno marshmallow, yeah. marshmallow study? Yeah. yeah. So, so this whole idea of delaying gratification, mm -hmm. and this is where there's a lot of interesting carryover to fitness, to writing, to business. Um, the more that kids were able to delay gratification in exchange for a greater goal later on, the more successful they'd be in basically every part of their life. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's all well and good. Um, I would have eaten the shit out of that marshmallow. So I actually own the domain secondmarshmallow.com. <laughs> you're, you're the second marshmallow guy, huh? Because I'm the second marshmallow guy. Because <laughs> I would never have gotten to that second marshmallow. Dude, I would have so found a way I'm to sweet. manipulate my way into getting the whole bag. <laughs> well, I, I so would have sweet talked and smiled my way into so getting the whole bag. So, <laughs> so that's a different thing altogether. So, so what I what I've done throughout my process is I've built in ways to give myself immediate gratification at every stage. So. I have this stack of cue codes on the right side of my computer when I'm writing, when I'm working on a book. Each cue code is a three to 600 word section. Nothing less, nothing more. Because if I'm sitting down and I'm saying, I've got four hours to write, it's gonna be 3,000 words this chapter. I'm gonna like clean my shoes, I'm gonna take out the garbage. You know, procrastinators are addicted to immediacy. Procrastination is is opportunity's natural assassin. Like you can throw out all these, all these fun phrases about how procrastinators basically do everything except for the one thing that they want to be doing. Mm -hmm. And so what I do is I trick myself into doing that one thing and I build an immediate gratification. So I write that three to 600 word section. I take that cue code. I move it to the other side of my computer and I put it face down. That's my reward each yeah. time. And so then I pick up the next one and I write that next section and I move it directly over to the left side of my computer. And that's that visual cue that mm -hmm. I'm doing the work each time as well. Um, and then it's, yeah, like like meshing it together into a book. It's not saying that every section is three to 600 words. It might be 10 of those that get patched together. But to be completely honest, that's an editor's job. That's not my job. Right. My job is to get the information down and to get the ideas down. It's an editor's job to craft it into work. Man, amazing. Um, so what are you working on next? I, I know you're planning on, uh, as we spoke about prior to the call, you're talking about heading out to six months abroad and enjoying some beautiful weather in Costa Rica. Um, what can people expect from you? You know, everyone's going to go out and buy your two books, your, your personal training set, because it's useful and, and very valuable. And do you have something else in the, uh, in the docket ready to go? Yeah. The, the biggest thing that we're, that we've got going on right now is the online trainer Academy. So that's, mm -hmm. that's the, that's the first ever certification for online fitness trainers. Um, I quite literally wrote the textbook on that subject. And so we've got an open enrollment. We do two enrollment periods that year. We've got an enrollment coming up November. Um, most of the work that we're doing right now is, is getting ready for that. Now, is that a more business-oriented, like how yeah. to run the business Purely. of online? Yeah. Purely. Good. I, like um, I assume that you know enough. I actually say straight up in the marketing, I don't want you to buy this until you train people for at least a year in person. Mm -hmm. You must to be me. proficient. Yeah. Or send them to you. You must be proficient mm -hmm. at, at programming 
um, you must understand your clients before you start online training. I don't think there's anything I can teach you if, if you don't do that. And then it's just a matter of setting up the perfect ideal business for you, um, setting it up in a way that it grows over time versus continually getting you into this like content wheel, promotion wheel, where you just do something and then it might work or it might not work. And then you have to do it again the next day and do it again the next way. Um, it's, it's all of these techniques that or, or strategies that kind of compound over time that, that we focus on. Um, and then how to operationalize your business. Mm -hmm. I mean, I walk you through how to set up standard operating procedures, for example, um, so that you can begin to remove yourself from a lot of the administrative type tasks and, and stick in your unique ability and your 5%. Beautiful, man. Uh, I love it. I think everybody needs it, myself included. You know, we all get, um, I mean, I know, I'm sure you're similar as, at some point, um, over managing and sometimes doing too much in your business and not enough on your business and um, just as guilty as everybody else, man. But um, I think what you're doing is awesome. I'm so grateful you took the time to give our listeners uh, information, valuable resources, and I highly recommend everybody heads over to online trainer dot com um you can check out michael uh jonathan goodman at uh instagram uh this is just jonathan what's the what's the handle oh geez i don't even know jonathan underscore goodman 101 or something there you go 101 that's know, right stupid instagram handle that's all right uh, well i'll post it on my social so that people cool. can directly link to you uh man i appreciate your time i i actually want to hear more about the no shoes one jeans and, and more shirts but we'll save that for the next episode Dude, i think that's really cool because honestly I'm, I'm going toward that too except I, I i also want to have like one closet that's like all suits and then you know my day-to-day -day right. stuff is like one pair of jeans and all my shirts are the same and all my shoes shoes are the same i like that idea but then you get, you know, I'm always like, man, I'm not going to train and I got to do yoga. <laughs> all these damn other outfits that get in the way. I wish I could just have jeans, black T-shirts and keep moving. But um, Jonathan, I appreciate your time so much. Give that beautiful wife and beautiful baby big kisses and hugs for me, man. I will. And uh, I look forward to when we can connect again and to seeing the great things and great books you come out with in the future. Thank you, man. Thank you. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that podcast. Thank you very much for listening. Head on over to iTunes right now and leave me a review. Let me know if you loved it. Let me know if you absolutely hated it. Either way, I need to know so I can improve my job uh, and bring you guys the best information with respect to muscle building, health optimization, and building a better person, building a better man. Um, so thank you very much to our sponsors, which make this stuff possible. Um, I'd love for you guys to each head over and check out atplab.com, ATP Labs or ATP Lab. Either one works. Um, ATP is a company I've recently aligned with because they have world-class manufacturing and everything they do is third-party tested and proven to be what it is inside the bottle that it says it is on the label. And you guys know that's massive. And not only that, we're getting the best quality ingredients from anywhere in the world that provides them. Thank you also to Prime Fitness USA, um, the best equipment for someone looking to build muscle and make the most of their time. Um, I chose to reach out to Prime personally. They never reached out to me. I reached out to them because I knew what they had, and I really believed in their product, and I brought every one of their pieces into my gym, and we still use them every day because, you know, we're all about mindful attention to detail. We are muscle intelligence. We are the ones teaching the best people in the world, the smartest people in the world, how to build muscle in the least amount of time. Uh, another shout out to Gasp and Better Bodies for always taking great care of myself and my trainers and my staff. If you guys want to get a discount for Gasp Better Bodies, head over to bambukolsky.com slash podcasts and check out the show notes from this show and all the other shows, and you can find transcripts there as well. So have a wonderful day. Upgrade your life, stay focused, and live a life of greatness. Join us on BenPokolsky.com to learn the cutting-edge techniques to take control of your body, your brain, and create your greatest life.